So a little bit about what is it that I do? A lot of people are confused about what a business consultant does, mostly because so many different people call themselves business consultant. Um, my particular brand of consulting has to do with helping your business work correctly from the get-go, helping you do things right from the beginning. Essentially, I help business uh, owners see around corners. You don't always know what's coming up. You don't know how the market environment may change and how that will affect what happens to your bottom line. Um, the unexpected can be very surprising, and I think, um, as Bonnie mentioned, uh, there are things that can happen that you're not prepared for, and how do you deal with those situations? I hope businesses put together strategic plans to help them deal with those unexpected uh, circumstances. I also serve as your sidekick for as long as you need me. I'm available for ongoing advisory services, coaching services. I work on project basis for specific problems that we can solve together. Um, I'm also available for regular meetings, and I can be part of your informal board of directors, just like Bonnie and, and Rebecca. So how do I do it? I essentially, I meet with you face to face for the first time or the first few several times. Uh, together we articulate your challenge or issue. It's important for both of us to agree what the problem really is in your business. What is it that's not working? I recommend one or more solutions depending on the situation. I usually like to either meet with your employees, review your business plan, your marketing plan, kind of try to figure out exactly what the root cause of the issue is and then come up with a, a, a solution. I will help you implement the solution. I will also provide you with the tools so that on an ongoing basis you can keep um, doing that yourself so you no longer need me um, on an ongoing basis. But if you do, I do remain available to you. What's today's presentation about? Well, obviously it's about success. It's the difference between success and failure. Why is it that some companies are wildly successful? And why is it that 45% of companies end up um, out of business within the first five years, as Pat mentioned? What I, I'm personally obsessed with successful businesses, and I am obsessed with finding the secrets behind success and, and teaching those to business owners so that they end up being successful. That is what I love to do. So before we move on, this is kind of on a light, a light um, hearted touch. Um, I love Dilbert. I think Dilbert tells the truth like nobody else does. Um, and this is a little snippet of Dilbert's view of success in his company. The company, this is the boss speaking, the company is happy to announce that compared to previous years, we improved our rate of revenue decline. We've been doing great since we redefined success as a slowing of failure. <laughs> Moving on, who has a status report? And there's one employee who says, I improved my rate of doing nothing. <laughs> so. <laughs> There's some truth to this, unfortunately, but my point is that is not what success really is, right? So what makes a company successful? It's actually pretty basic. It just simply means that you grow smart, and growing smart means to grow profitably. Um, it's not necessarily bigger. Bigger is not necessarily better. You can have a lot of high sales at a loss and, and essentially go bankrupt, whereas you can have few profitable sales and come out way ahead. So we focus on better not bigger. The best companies in the world, and what I mean by best companies, I'm talking about the one hundredth of the top one percent of the companies in the world that are truly successful. What that means is that they grow, they have double digit growth for ten years in a row or more regardless of economic conditions. So these are truly successful companies who come out ahead no matter what the competition is doing, no matter what the economy is doing, no matter what the stock market is doing. These companies grow organically, meaning that they don't grow through acquisitions or mergers, they just grow from inside, and they grow profitably every single year. And those are the 10 strategies of success that we're going to discuss today. What is the secret? It's really not magic. Once you master the fundamentals, success will usually naturally follow as a, as a consequence. And this is, these are the 10 strategies that all these companies have in common. The first one, obviously, is to have a strategy in the first place. A strategy means having a plan. If you don't know where you want to go, you're not going to get there. There is no right answer as to what your strategy should be. For example, a client may want to open up a restaurant, grow it, make it profitable, and then later on open up a new one, and then a third one and a fourth one, and then keep expanding outside of the state of Minnesota. That is a perfectly solid strategy, and there are things that we can do to get this client to where he wants to go. On the other extreme, you can have a one-person business who wants to work 30 hours a week, 
have six profitable clients that make her $150,000 a year. And she wants to work with those clients on an ongoing basis, not get any more clients, not work anymore, and she's perfectly happy. That is defined as success for her, okay? So what does it take to have a good strategy? First of all, you have to define your target market. You have to know who are, you, who are the clients that you're going after? Who are the clients that you want to work with? Who are the clients that want to work with you? And in order to do that, you build your client avatar. My eight-year-old plays Wii all the time, and his favorite thing to do is to build his avatar. And he puts together the hair and the glasses and the T-shirt and the shorts and the shoes, and he changes it, and he thinks it's hilarious. Bottom line is, it, it's a similar concept of knowing who your ideal client is. How old are they? Are they middle-aged? Are they young? Are they suburban or city dwellers? Are they interested in health? Are they interested in making money? Are they interested in traveling? Do they like lux luxury um, you know, products or do they like to contribute to charity and volunteer? Everyone is different, but knowing who you're going after is really important. Don't try to be all things to all people. If you do that, you'll end up being nobody to everybody. Um, being specific and targeted is key here when it comes to a strategic plan. It's also important to have a plan before you actually need one. Um, and I know Bonnie mentioned this, and I would like to reiterate that fact. It's extremely important to have a plan ahead of time on how you would respond if s next door to you, another competitor opens up shop, offering the same products at lower prices. What are you going to do? How do you, how do you sustain that? How do you stay ahead without going out of business? How do you sustain a nonstop price attack? What happens if you work in retail and Walmart opens next door and they offer your products at half the price? What do you do? Um, how do you own the space that you're in and stop others from coming in? What kind of barriers can you set up to make sure that your business stays intact and healthy? Those are all things that you, that you would get with a strategic plan. The second principle is staying attuned to your customers. I can't emphasize this enough. The customers are the lifeblood of your business. Without customers, you are not going to make it. Y it's important to listen to your customers. Um, and this can be as basic as have someone that can answer the phone when clients call. Um, I know it's easy for, for you know, calls to go to voicemail or to have automated phone systems. But in reality, people are tired of, thank you for calling such and such business. Our call is important to us. Please. You know, uh, please listen carefully as our menu options have changed. I think all of our eyes glaze over because we're so tired of hearing that exactly. Um, respo respond to all communications, whether they're requests, whether they're complaints, whether they're um, uh, compliments, positive feedback, anything like that. Personally acknowledge client responses. Have processes and policies in place to address complaints and requests for refunds, anything that comes from the client. And the reason for that is. If you don't have those planned out ahead of time, you end up having to make decisions on the spot, which is time consuming, it's complicated, you have to figure things out, you have to decide what you're going to do in this situation, which may be different from what you're going to do in the next situation. If you do have employees, they need to have that stuff all laid out in a training manual type of document so they have something to refer to. Having processes in place ahead of time also ensures that all your clients get a consistent experience, that they're not essentially one client gets one thing and another client gets something else gets something else because essentially they do talk and you don't want that being out there um, that you don't treat all your clients the same. The benefits of providing great customer service are that you protect your brand and your reputation which are a huge asset for your company. Um, you build customer loyalty, you increase client retention which in turn will decrease your marketing costs because you don't have to go look for clients all the time because the ones that you have are staying with you. The third strategy is to never stop innovating. As you guys know, the only sustainable advantage is innovation. No matter how great you are, no matter how unique your product is, somewhere along the way there's going to be somebody who's either going to copy what you're doing or come up with a better one. So at some point in time you always have to be thinking ahead about how you're going to make your product or service better. The best source of information for that is going to be your client. If you listen to your clients, they will tell you what they don't like, what pain points they have, what is it that they wish you could give them that you're not giving them today. Um, so let me just give you an example with a remodeling company I worked with. Um, they wanted to set their prices a little <coughs> higher, and they, were, they didn't know how to position themselves as to not be drowned by the competition, all these g other guys coming in with lower and lower bids. So we, we talked about finding some pain points or some... Um, 
removing some obstacles that, that homeowners would have had with, with home remodelers in the past. So for example, what do you guys hate about getting your, your house remodeled or your basement done? What's the worst thing about it that drives you absolutely crazy? Yes, thank you. It is the, it, it's always, always horribly messy. And do they clean up? Yes. So if they do your basement, they're going to do it and then they're going to clean up, right? What happens with the dust? It floats all the way up to the top floor. Do they clean up the top floor? No. So we put a process in place to where this home remodeler offered 100% free clean, home cleaning service top to bottom, including your windows, your baseboards, everything. So your house is going to be cleaner after your remodelers leave than it was when they first came in. The other thing that they offered um, at our suggestion was, um, well, the other thing that happens when you remodel your house is nothing matches anymore because you've redone your walls, you've redone your cupboards, and all of a sudden things are just clashing. Um, so he partnered with an interior decorator, and he offered every single one of his clients a free one-hour consultation with an interior decorator and a 20% discount for any services that they would purchase. So this became a win-win situation. He's giving his clients something that they're not getting anywhere else, and he's also referring business to his friend who is the interior decorator. So again, those are things that help you innovate so that you're better and different than your competitors. Taking calculated risks. Um, innovating essentially means that you're taking a risk. You're doing something and you're not sure what the outcome is going to be. But remember that attempts to eliminate all failure all the time essentially ensure that you will always fail. Because unless you try something new or different, you are not going to succeed. The fourth strategy is to improve your operations. Basically, everything that you do in your business day to day, any repeatable process that you do, such as billing, marketing, customer service, all of those things can be automated and improved. What that does, essentially, it saves you time, it reduces your expenses, and it increases your profitability. I have a list of key tools um, on this slide that every business should have incorporated into their day to day operations. All of these tools are things that will make your life easier and that will decrease the time you spend not servicing customers or, or marketing for or marketing to new customers. Um, checklists, pre-populated templates, um, training manuals, schedule all of your activities ahead of time. For example, every Monday you send out invoices. On Tuesdays you do your marketing stuff. On Fridays you do your QuickBooks. Whatever the case may be, have a, syst a syst systematic approach to how you do things. Customer relationship management tools. Um, Constant Contact and MailChimp for marketing and for communications. Um, Skype, if you're doing business with clients that are out of state, that is a great tool for communication. Cloud storage, um, it gets rid of a lot of your IT problems, not having to deal with your hard drive crashing. Um, QuickBooks, absolutely. For tax purposes, QuickBooks is the way to go. The fifth strategy is to invest wisely in your business. So what I mean by that is, Focusing on activities or investments that give you the highest rate of return on investment, uh, which is basically what you spend versus what you get. A lot of small business owners are, don't want to spend money on their business, and that can be a huge mistake because if you spend zero and you get zero, you're a lot worse off than if you spend 5000 and you get 15000 in return. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to make sure that you do your numbers right so that that 5000 truly turns into a $15,000 return. But if you do it the right way, it will pay off, and it is the right way to go. Spend 80% of your time and resources on activities that make you money. A lot of people spend 50 to 60% of their time just running their business, um, when in reality, most of your time should be spent serving existing clients or marketing to new clients. We talked about taking calculated risks. That's also part of investing. Um, let go of what's not working. Um, a lot of people do what, if, what they've always done because they've always done it. It's just easy. It's the, it's the way to go. I recently worked with an engineering firm whose um, marketing efforts consisted 100% of telemarketing, telesales. They had their people on the phone trying to get appointments um, seven, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day. And over time, their profits and their revenues went completely um, in, in the negative growth. Uh, percent. It was, it was absolutely crazy. They, were, they went from scheduling five to six appointments a week to less than one a week. And they didn't know what was wrong, but they kept doing the only thing they knew how to do, which was cold calling. Well, in today's day and age with Facebook and LinkedIn and networking and organization, professional organizations, people don't cold call. And w guess what else? 
We have caller ID. Do you pick up the phone if you don't know the number? I don't. A lot of people don't. So again, you know, you need to you need to kind of let go of what's not working and come up with a new strategy. So in this particular case, we had this client set up with a lot of professional organizations. Um, we introduced them to a lot of CEOs of other companies, and we basically plugged into we plugged them into the industry where they wanted to find their clients through informal and professional connections. And that is how they were finally able to get back on track with their profits. And last but not least, consider the cost of doing nothing. The cost of doing nothing is not zero. The cost of doing nothing is usually much higher because while you're doing nothing, your competitors are doing more. They're developing, they're investing, they're, they're um, coming up with new technologies, new systems. So what happens is clients and customers are getting used to that level of service and if they see that you're not offering it, they're gonna leave and they're gonna go to someone who is. The sixth strategy is to outsource intelligently. And we've talked about this earlier today, but it's, it's a very basic truth. You cannot do everything yourself. And people know that, but they don't actually act that way. And people still try to do everything themselves. It is not possible. Even if it were possible, you cannot do everything well. I can't. Nobody can. It's just not, not the, way, um, the way things work. So if you, if you do outsource, what should you be outsourcing? Well, the most obvious one are um, administrative functions. Anything that's too easy or too time consuming. If you can pay someone $10 an hour to do your filing for you, why would you do it yourself when you know very well that if you work with a client and you get a project, your average hourly rate would be $85 an hour? You know, obviously it's a no-brainer. Anything for which you don't have the expertise, anything that's too difficult for you that you don't have the training for, the education. Um, so taxes, legal matters, um, strategy, business analysis, branding, all of these things are things that you should try to outsource as much as possible. And then last but not least, things that you hate doing. Uh, and again, that's a personal preference, but I hate doing QuickBooks. I really do. I know it's easy. Everyone talks about how great and how it does itself. Can't stand it. So that's why I hire firms like Bonnie's to do that for me. So again, focus on what you're good at and what you enjoy doing because that is where most of your success is going to come from. The seventh strategy is to build mutually beneficial alliances. Have a peer network. Make friends with your competitors. I know this sounds counterintuitive, but most of the time, not a, one business is not a good fit for every client. There's something, there, there will be something that's different enough about your competitor that will make them a better fit for a client that's not a good fit for you. And you, you need to understand those things so you can refer business back and forth and not have it be a cutthroat, doggy dog kind of relationship. So your competitors can be great resources for you. Build strategic alliances. For example, in my business, my strategic alliances can be with CPA firms, um, business attorneys, small business lenders, um, commercial insurance agents. All of those are, are um, businesses that can refer me business and I can refer clients back to them. Turn your vendors into partners. Turn your vendors, um, treat your vendors really well. If you do, they will treat you well in return. I'm not going to name any names of big retailers that start with the letter W. Who, who bully their, their vendors into lower prices. <laughs> but just, just remember, it's not always the right way to go. Uh, build loyalty or refer affiliate programs. So basically offer incentives. If, if a client refers you another client, give them a discount on their next purchase. So anything to incent referrals is always a good idea as well. And all of those things basically create a win-win culture. So you know you come out ahead and they come out ahead. It's a really good way to do business that way. Number eight, make information-based decisions. Um, it's really important to always be clear about why you're doing what you're doing. There's two types of information that you should always know, which is your internal numbers and your external information. Internal numbers has to do with all the numbers inside your business, your sales, your revenues, where, where does your money go, which clients make you the most money. You guys have heard the 20-80 rule, right? 20% of your clients make you 80% 80, 80 of your revenues. And the 20 and the 80 percent that don't make you any money at all, they're giving you the most problems and they're the most high maintenance. So, so keep that in mind as to who your best customers are and treat them accordingly. Give them priority. They deserve it. In terms of external information, know your competition. To study what they're doing, study the market, study new developments, trends, anything that that kind of lets you know what's coming down the pike in terms of your business and how that will be affected. Attend conferences, continue ed education, anything like that, that will always help you. 
Um, price strategically, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but essentially um, there are two ways for people to price their products, and I don't really like either one. One of them is to match your competitor's prices. That's not a good idea because your competitors may not set their own prices correctly, number one. Your product or service may not be identical to theirs. It may be better, it may be worse, and you need to know that. Um, the second way to set prices is essentially to do cost, cost plus profit. So if it costs you $10 to make a widget, you add a $2 profit to it and you sell it for $12. Um, that particular strategy doesn't work as well either because it leaves the customer out of the equation. Your client doesn't care how much it costs you to make your product. They don't care. What, what they care about is, is it worth it to me? So strategic pricing focuses on value. Here's a quick example of someone who has mastered the concept of strategic pricing. On a sunny day in New York City, you can buy an umbrella for $5. As soon as it gets overcast and starts raining, prices of umbrella, what do you think happens? $15, do people buy them? Yep, yep. why, because they're stuck walking on the street, they don't have a car. And that is a perfect example of value pricing. It's asking the client, what is it worth to you? Not what it's costing me, okay? That's not the important thing. So essentially, pricing strategically maximizes your profits by capturing more ways to sell your product at different product margins. This can get kind of complicated. It's hard to explain in one slide, but essentially it's about offering choices and options. Offer your clients a high price, high value package. Offer them a middle option, which is kind of the average in between, and offer them a bare bones, just stripped down version of whatever product it is, because they may not want all the bells and whistles and they don't want to pay for them. So offer them a, just a pared down version of it at a price that they can afford. And that way you can attract a variety of customer segments. Number 10, and this one's my favorite, it's move beyond the competition. Out of the 10 strategies, it is the hardest one to implement, it's the hardest one to grasp. What that means is that there are times when you should break the rules. There are times when you should refuse to play the dog-eat-dog -dog game. Um, and essentially what it is is finding a way to go into an untapped or underserved market that no one else has gone before you. I have a great story about this. Has anyone heard of Yellowtail Wines? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know the story behind Yellowtail Wines? Mm -hmm. They come from Australia. They wanted to break into the wine market, and they couldn't because their wines were not sophisticated enough and they couldn't compete with all the fancy French Bordeaux and Merlots and all the California wines and the, Argentina, the um, Argentinian wines. So what did they do? They said, you know what, forget all that. We're not going to play in your territory. Your market's really small. Mar margins are really small. You only have so many wine drinkers in, in a country. I mean, you're not going to have too many more. It kind of stays the same. There's not much growth in it. So what did they do? They designed a wine for beer drinkers and for liquor drinkers. So what they did is they, they threw everything away. They threw out everything that all the other ones did, all the other wine producers. So what they did is they created one red wine and one white wine. So you no longer have to figure out, does Cabernet go with steak or do I need a, a Shiraz with salad? It, it, it threw away the whole snobby aspect. The how, how can you tell if it, what the taste is? Is it an oaky taste? All of that was out the window. It's, it's a very drinkable, easy to taste, easy to, easy to, just easy on the palate kind of wine. You get one red wine, wine, one white wine. They priced it at $9.99 per bottle. What that means is that it is affordable to everyone. You can drink it by yourself or you can drink it with food. They advertised it to the average Joe. The labeling and the language on the label was basic. The commercials and the advertisements were fun and approachable and lighthearted. What do you think happened to sales? Through the roof. Who do you think bought the wine? Was it the wine, the, the wine snobs? Nope. All the people who like to drink beer and relax on the patio, they bought those wines. Yellowtail wine went into an untapped or underserved market and made a ton of money. So that is actually a really good example of how to do this. If you guys can figure out how to do that in your business, let me know, because I want more stories on that. <laughs> what else? If you walk out of here remembering only three things, this should be these three. Have a unique value proposition. Know exactly how your product or service is different, how it's better, and, how, uh, and why your client should buy it in, from you instead of your competitor. Specialize and target. <coughs> and then last but not least, innovate. 
Thank you so much for attending. Here's my information. If you do call me and you mention this presentation, you'll get a 25% off your initial consulting project. And if you have any questions, um, just catch me in the back. I don't know if, I, if I'm up to the 25. I'm good. Do you rent hourly or? I'm actually very flexible because I specialize in pricing. I believe in flexibility. So I, I do offer an entrepreneur package. I do hourly rates. I can do fixed project rates. And, if, and I'm also very willing to, to add services or take out services to kind of meet everyone's pricing demands. So it, you know, I, I, I'm very, very flexible. I realize a lot of entrepreneurs don't always have the high budgets. So because of that, um, I firmly believe that every single big company was once a small company. And every single successful company started out as a one or two person shop. And I want to be part of that beginning level where it's a baby and you take care of it and you grow it. And because of that, I do, I am very flexible with my pricing.